Good morning, church. We are so glad to have you here with us this morning, worshiping in spirit and in truth. I know right now we can't meet in the building, and that's why I am thankful for technology during this time so that we can connect and engage just like we are. But I will say, man, do I miss your smiling faces. I miss being able to shake hands. I miss being able to give hugs on a Sunday. But that day is coming again at some point soon. And until then, we are going to worship together just like this in spirit and in truth. We want to give you some information to stay connected during the week. Um, as many of you have probably seen on our Facebook page, on the church website, on the app, you can see that this calendar um, has all of our contact information on it, all of the different connection points during the week. Uh, there's stuff for married couples. There are things for families. There's different you know, uplifts during the day. There's a coffee time with Pastor Mike in the mornings at 8 a.m., um, all kinds of stuff to stay connected throughout the week. So we want to make sure that you check out this calendar and know what's going on so you can stay connected. Also, church, just want to remind you that there are two ways that you can give right now as well. Um, you can send in your checks you know, through the mail directly uh, to the church um, using the postal service, or you can give online using the app or our website. Both ways are great. They're easy to do. Uh, the online stuff, you can just you know click your way through and, and do it through there. It's very easy. Um, but we, we do want you to know that you can give that way during this time. Um, that being said, we are glad that you're joining with us this morning. We're so thankful for you. Uh, cannot wait to worship with you together. Hey, guys. So glad you can worship with us this morning. Um, we are the church as we are gathered together. So uh, as we sing... As we proclaim, we want to give him praise even as we're all online. So I want to introduce you to the team. It's going to be uh, Freddie and the Bunch. A uh, little pun intended there. So say hello to the whole team as we worship, as we sing together. So join us online. Uh, let us give him praise. We give him praise because he lives in our hearts. Uh, we are thankful for that. So come on. Three, four. <laughs>
He lives in us.
With hearts and beats and songs that never frame the fullness of your worth and majesty. We come up there and fall on bended knee and hear adore the God that we don't see. Though we cannot. Welcome this morning, Ocean State Baptist Church, connecting online, uh, being the church as the church has remobilized itself. And uh, I want to begin with prayer and uh, then get into God's word with you and encourage you uh, in the ways that God has shown me this week, encourage me from the text we're going to read from today. Let's pray together. Everlasting Father, we come to you. We are seeking you, seeking your grace, your mercy, your help your sustaining power. And Father, from your word that you exiled here with us on this planet, Lord, we are seeking guidance, seeking insight into the times in which we live, that we may live uh, prudently and wisely, uh, proclaiming your message, uh, how you have placed us. Lord, we accept your will. Just help us to do your will uh, in its acceptance, Father, and be the church you called us to be. We lift up to you our nation, the world. We pray for our frontline workers. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for this nation. We pray for those in governing authorities. We pray, Lord, for our churches all across the globe today. And Father, we want to see you glorified. The weight of your significance would be intensified through your people eagerly repenting of sin confessing their faults and their struggles that, Lord, you get our attention and that we may turn back to you in ways that we are called to, in ways of love and mercy and truth. Now, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just anoint me by your Holy Spirit, filling me as I preach this message this morning to your people and to those who uh, watch now online, Lord, in this time we have. Thank you for this day. We boast not of tomorrow. 
Uh, Father, we don't know what the day, the next day will bring forth. So help us this day, Lord, to be what you've called us to be in the hours you've given to us. We ask for the wisdom to count our days and apply our hearts to wisdom. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're praying as a church, and I want to tell you, church, we're making our way to Resurrection Sunday, and uh, we are ready to uh, worship on that day. We will worship on Resurrection Sunday, however it's going to go down. Uh, we will meet that day. Now, every day is Resurrection Sunday for us. Uh, this, this day is just magnified in, in, in the seasonal capacity in which we've given it. But, man, we are going to worship on that day. And I want us to set our focus on that way, on that road to that day, because we need that moment to understand that over all things, Jesus has overcome the world. And so on that road, I, I, I found myself reading the Gospel of Luke. And that's what we're going to look at this morning, Luke chapter 22. Verse 39 through 46. Luke 22, verse 39 through 46. Jesus now has come out from the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, uh, which will become the picture of the Lord's Supper for us. And the Bible says, verse 39, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. And his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray as you enter into temptation. It was the great Charlie Brown who once said, when something, is bad, something bad is about to happen, there shouldn't be a night before. <laughs> and I think you and I would agree with old Charlie Brown. Have you ever had that anxious ache uh, the night before? You lay in your bed wondering, how is this all going to go down? What is going to happen? What is ahead? What will take place? It might have to do with something God was leading you to do or something that had to do with something unexpected in your life that was occurring. Or maybe it was the results you were waiting for uh, or a procedure happening the next day. Or maybe it was something in the news that was interrupting your entire way of life. In the writings of the book of Job, I found this week, Job said, I am made to possess months of vanity and wearisome nights are appointed to me. Job 7, verse 3. Man, did I find that verse an eye-opener this week. Let me read that one more time. I am made to, and this is a biblical truth, I am made to possess months of vanity and wearisome nights are appointed to me. We all have these times. These kinds of nights and weeks come packed with a continual surge of anxiety or fear or tension. When we hear the words, you're going to need surgery for this. Or they're going to be laying off a lot of people at work. Or you need to meet with them and tell them the truth that they continue to refuse to hear. Or you must stay indoors for the next few weeks. Stock up on food. This virus keeps spreading. I'm going to gently say that Jesus understands the surge of anxiety and tension over these kinds of things that come at us in our life. Did Jesus ever dread the next day? Yep. Did Jesus ever have to face the facts of God's will? Yup. Did Jesus ever feel alone? Yes. Did Jesus ever feel isolated? Yes. Let me start with that truth that Jesus is truly our sympathizing Savior. The Bible tells us that about him. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, This high priest of ours of ours, possession, understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do. Yet he did not sin. Jesus, our Savior, he knows what we are facing, and Jesus is with us. 
With Jesus, we're never alone. And that's what I'm going to preach on this morning. Never alone. In this passage of Luke 22, we're led into the heart of Jesus as never before in the Gospels. In the garden, we see a Jesus who did not appear in the Gospels before this time. This part of the story is much deeper, I think, than we let it be. A lot of times people look right past it, it, but yet it provides such a simple, simple guidance when we are in the garden of anticipating the unknown or in the garden of the anxiety of fear, uh, the anxiety of tensions and situations or in the garden of loneliness or in the garden of isolation. Jesus understands this. And in Christ, we are never alone. Imagine it now. Jesus is there with you right now in this time of national crisis. He's in your heart. If you're a born again, saved believer this morning, Jesus Christ is in your very heart and being, and he's in your home. He's there with you. You are his home. At the same time as a pastor, let me say that while there's a great focus on the national crisis going on around us, there are many who are caught in the grips of the same struggles they had before the crisis began. Others going through health crises outside of a virus, going through the crisis of cancer, the crisis of a debilitating disease. Others are worried about the next few months of income. Many are still the same people before this all happened, and they're wrestling with the same fear and worry and depression that they had their whole life before all of this got started. So I want to encourage all of us, no matter where we are, to draw near to Christ because he knows our present difficulties. Jesus sees us, whether we're losing sleep, what we're losing sleep about, whether we're caught in the thorns of anxiety, whether we're caught in the thorns of a lack of income, of gainful employment, whatever you're facing right now, either in your family or in your health or in your situation in life or in our nation, we are never alone in Christ. Here's a few things to provide that hope and that wisdom about this fact. Number one, Jesus understands our fears. That's number one this morning. Jesus understands our fears. Luke twenty two forty one 41 says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed. Luke economizes, excuse me, the scene here. So let me add Mark's parallel to this in the gospel of Mark. Mark goes a little bit more here as Peter was there and Mark is considered Peter's gospel. But in the, in the gospel of Mark chapter 14, it says that they came to the place, verse 32, which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled. Now, look at this in Mark 14, 33. He began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. I mean, here Jesus brings his closest friends with him. And he calls upon them to pray. And the text says he was troubled and deeply distressed, which refers to a great terror, a great heavy heartache. He says, my soul is full of horror, so much so that it's threatening my very life. And here we have in the Gospels, we have the very humanity of Christ. Turn back to Luke 32, uh, 22, excuse me. Here we have the humanity of Christ. Jesus could see out into uh, his imminent death on the cross. And the obvious panic of this event, the dread that he experienced, he said it was deadly to him. And what we must draw from this is that Jesus knows our fears. Jesus knows human fear and what it's like and how it occurs and how it racks the brain and the psyche of, of ourselves and uh, how it can even affect our body. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Gethsemane, I was there back in 1998. I laid down in the field of Gethsemane, looked up at the trees. Some of them, they say, are almost as old as going back to the time of that garden. But laying down there, the word Gethsemane is an olive press. And isn't that fitting where we find Jesus, the Messiah? He's being pressed out. He's being crushed for us. Luke says in his gospel that an angel came to him to strengthen him as he sweat drops of blood. The Bible says in, in verse uh, uh, 43, it says, then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, 
he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Man, that's intense. Only Luke refers to Jesus praying and sweating this way. And it makes sense because Luke was an ancient world uh, physician. And so maybe because of that, he was more prone to report this occurrence in his document. It was actually a, 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 a medical uh, occurrence that was reported even by Aristotle uh, of others in his time. And it was called, uh, back, back at that time, it was called thrombi hymatas. And it referred to blood that would mingle with the sweat and it would thicken into, the, into beads of sweat that would fall to the ground like little clots. Now, doing a simple research of medical literature, uh, we find that this is actually a real medical case, extremely rare, but it does occur in, in, in humans at times, and it's actually called hematidrosis. It's a condition that results in the excretion of blood or blood pit, pigment in the sweat of a person. It's recorded that under conditions of great emotional stress, tiny capillaries in the sweat glands will rupture and blood will mix with the perspiration. I looked it up and I found that it was recorded in the 20th century. 76 cases of hematidrosis in the 20th century were studied and classified. One medical report in 1996 stated that, quote, acute fear and intense mental contemplation were found to be the most frequent that incited the causes of hematidrosis. That was an interesting find. From these factors, I can, I can take what I see here in this text and bring it to the reality of what was taking place here, that it's evident that before Jesus would endure the torture of the cross for us, Jesus suffered with deep fear and inner stress that caused this condition of hematidrosis. His blood began to spill before he even got to the cross. Perhaps it was his penetrating awareness that he was to become the very body of, of heinous sin in the next several hours. Wrapped up in its destructive and deadly effects, now that deep sting of sorrow just plagues the mind of the Messiah. His heart breaks up about this infliction that's coming and affliction that's coming. He will become the whipping post and the sacrificial lamb so that, 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 that our sin, yours and mine, can be necessarily dealt with. This is the Savior that suffered with us. This is the Savior that suffered for us. Jesus knows that the wages of sin is death, and he's about to pay the wages in full. And that's what the Bible teaches. That's what Scripture teaches. If you want another Jesus that's a nice old peasant sitting on some rock, teaching nice little aphorisms and quips and puns and quotes, things you can post, then you go ahead. But that isn't the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of Scripture is very clear what is taking place here. And the Jesus of the scripture knows that this death is the result of the judgment of God and that he's about to bear that judgment. The Bible tells us that. He knows he's about to become sin for every sinner. The Bible tells us that in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He knows he's about to taste death for every man, says Hebrews chapter 2. He knows that his death is the wrath of God, says Romans chapter 3. That it will explode on him in every direction so that, that we then can find salvation because it's in Christ who will soothe the righteous judgment of God that we deserve. The Bible says so in Romans Romans chapter 3, that he is the propitiation for our sins, which is the justified, uh, the, the satisfactory uh, satisfaction of God. You know, he pleases that, that and satisfies the justice of God. Isaiah 53, 10 said, it pleased the Lord to peruse him. He has put him to grief, says the Isaiah 53 prophecy. And all of this will be done to make our salvation possible. Through this, Christ will justify many, says the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before the time of Christ's death. This is all written in the, in the Old Testament scrolls. But right now, as we come back to this text and zero in here, right now it's fear that's encircling the Messiah. And it's not the fear of death that Jesus has, but the fear of all that death means on this world before God. It's in this piece of the story that we can find our comfort though because we know that the Messiah knows our fears. He faced this fear. He knew what was ahead and he understands our fears. He knows what we're going through. We're not alone when we know Christ and when we reach for Christ in our fearful hours. This Messiah did all this for us. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He faced all the same testings that we do. Cling to Christ today. 
Go to Christ today. Cling to Christ today. What else does Jesus show us? Number two this morning, Jesus directs us to pray. In verse 40, it says, When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. Are we praying more during this time? This is a time of great temptation. I'm going to tell you that right now. You know, we're, we're, we're thankful for the, have the online devices and all the online media, but I'm going to tell you right now, this is a time of great temptation to come to the, to the, to the church. We're inundated by now all these things, and, and to say that we're going to have something on, online for every, all of you guys also means that what we, what, we, what we attract you with will attract you too. We know this, and that's why I'm saying we had better be praying more before we connect online with one another and be exposed to the things that are on the social media devices. Let's be wise here. But more than this, not even just the media reality, but we must also pray more because of the great time of temptation while we're, while we're home and stuck and more to be aggravated and angry and frustrated or confused, or maybe we'll start ignoring the truths and the facts of what's actually happening. I'm going to tell you, it's a great time of temptation and Jesus knows and Jesus directs us to pray. Jesus here runs to his father. Does our fear, our anxiety, our frustrations, our current situation, does it run us to the Father? Or to more frustration or to more food? Or does it run us to more foolish distractions? Have you and I been praying more during the last two weeks? Only God can comfort us. Only God can console us. Only God can strengthen us and guide us. We must run to the Father in prayer. When my daughter was younger, she always had a way of sneaking into the bed with us in the middle of the night, scared. And uh, she would come in there, and my, my wife was very vigilant about that. You know, I didn't care at all. You know, I, I was, it became kind of a joke because Eve would see me. When I would say goodnight to her, she would whisper to me and say, Hey, Dad, save me a spot. And uh, so in the middle of the night, I'd hear the, I'd hear the pitter-patter of little feet She'd crash into the bed and a little radiator would just jump up into my, into my rib cage and, Dad, I'm scared. <laughs> and I'm telling you that in this text here, verses 40 and 41, Jesus is running into his father and he's saying, Dad, I'm scared. And he's directing us to prayer. This is prayer. Sweet prayer is the direction that Jesus gives to us here. Prayer. Prayer. He shows us that prayer is without question much more than just content, form, and liturgy, and an act that we must do. No, this is about relationship and about surrender. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to God more right now than I did before. So what was happening before? I started equating these things in my mind, but I, want to, I need God right now. I want to walk with God closer to God. And if that's what has to come out of such a time as this, then so be it. But that's where Jesus goes. That's where Jesus goes in the trial. He goes to prayer. And that's his spiritual direction to us. We should be praying more during this time. We should be seeing that prayer is what we needed all the time. That we must go to prayer. Listen, my friends, prayer is all that a person, it's all that a man can do, a woman can do when they're on their knees before God. That's all that we've got. I, I think it was Charles Spurgeon said that prayer was the slender nerve on the muscle of God. And prayer is the only omnipotence God lends to human beings. And prayer is spitting in the face of the devil. And the devil right now wants to get us off our course. We must pray. We must pray. And we must pray more than we have before. Be creative about it. Be creative about it with your children, with your homes. Let's pray. Let's fast and pray. Number three, Jesus leads us to total surrender saying to the father in verse 42, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, I never noticed this before, but I've been reading in the prophets this last week and a half, two weeks, and I've been reading the prophet Isaiah, and I'm looking through, just looking through, through the prophets because they've lived through these times. Uh, and uh, there, there may be a possible allusion here to something the prophet Isaiah recorded God saying to the people in chapter 51 of his prophecy. God told the Jewish nation in that chapter that he was, 
He had allowed the nation to drink from the cup of his judgment, but was willing to pass that cup now to those who deserve that justice more than they did. And I came across that in, in Isaiah 51. I, I thought, is it possible that Jesus, as a, as a Jewish rabbi and savior, is he hinting to this image that's found in Isaiah's writings? Is Jesus suggesting to God the Father the same principle, that to let someone else take this cup of deserved judgment? Is that possible? He is asking God if there's another way. Perhaps God the Father would do this for Christ the Son. Perhaps there was another way to do this. But he surrenders. We also must realize that it's a cup we deserve. In a sense, that, that principle of Isaiah 51, I realize that it's a cup that you and I deserve. And yet we're going to find that Jesus is going to drink it for us. As Hebrews 2.9 says, For by the grace of God, Jesus should taste death for every man. Jesus takes the cup and he drinks it down to his bottom. The other thing is the cup in Jewish thought also signifies one's destiny in life. David, we saw last week in Psalm 23, he said, my cup runs over. But here we find Jesus with the cup on this week too. And like David, his cup was running over for Jesus. His cup is tumbling over him. David's cup was filled with life and fullness. Jesus' cup is filled with sin and death. Jesus is staring into the deep, filthy cesspool of human sins, and it sits there before him. He knows it's his destiny to drink it, to drink it down to the last drop for the sake of the world. He asks in that moment if there's another way. And this is what I realized. It's in this moment where the Savior's own possible free will collides with his own passionate love for his Father's will. His own free will collides with his love for his people. Hearing the sound of every human heartbeat that would ever beat in this earth, sounding off now in his soul. The hope of every human life, hoping in all of the history of salvation. In that moment, Jesus could see into the landscape of his Father's perfect love, tempered by the Father's perfect justice, motivated by the, by the Father's perfect plan. And there, Jesus surrenders to the Father's perfect will for you and for me. Jesus surrendered himself so that he can save us. And I'm telling you this morning, the cross is the only way. The cross is the only way. We must all come first to the cross of Jesus Christ. It's there where Jesus' surrender is where we find our only salvation. And if we have already come to the cross brothers and sisters, if we've already come to the cross for salvation, let's get ready now to take up that cross for real. Let's not forget that Jesus went to a cross for us to save us from the, from the sin virus. And some of us, most of us are called right now to go to a couch to slow down the process of a man virus. We must find our strength renewed and our faith deepened by going to the cross of Jesus Christ in our understanding and in our worship and in our walk and in our faith and in our spirituality right now as believers in this land. This is about surrender. If you believe this morning that God has your heart, then try looking at this time as God trying to get your attention. I think there's a lot of good people that God's got your heart, but you know what? Maybe in this time, God's just trying now to get your attention. And we need God to get our attention. Jesus leads us on this path of looking out at the eternal and seeing beyond the struggle of the temporary. Jesus leads us in the path of staying close to God in this time of crisis and, and leading us to stay surrendered to him and to see the cross and to get the message of the cross out to everybody. He leads us in this way. He knows this is the way because Jesus is the way. God wants us to be like Christ. You know, church, I've been saying to you, be the church, be the church. Can I challenge you? Being the church means be Jesus. Be the church means be the Christ. Be the church means be Christ. And I tell you this morning, if you're going to be the church means to be Jesus, means you're going to take the, the cross 
of Christ and the message of the cross. Jesus chose the cross. He surrendered to the Father's will. Whatever we're facing, whatever we're passing through, let us walk with Jesus who knows our emotions, our desires, our fears, our weaknesses, our problems, and let us pray and let us surrender to God and keep doing good and doing the gospel preaching that we're called to do while we're here on earth and let us encourage each other in this regard and let us encourage each other today that Jesus never leaves us alone. Look at verse 45. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. He said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray unless you fall into temptation. Listen, Jesus knows what loneliness is. He knows what loneliness is in the struggles of life. Jesus was quarantined in the darkness of that long night, separate from his family, separate from his friends, separate from his creation. And soon he would cry out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would be separate from the relational aspect of his father. Jesus knows what quarantine is and Jesus knows what loneliness is. And listen, my friends, I know, I know that you need to hear this. Jesus is with you. Jesus is never leaving you alone. He will never leave you or forsake you. He's there with you. He's there with us. And he's calling us now to do something. Listen, I know that we're going to return to assembling together at some point. And I know the online community action has been a great thing. It'll never replace church to be together. It'll never replace it. And it's all, it's made us all feel as if we're just a stone's throw away. And like Jesus, we all long to be together again. Listen, Jesus in the Gospels, he says, I can't wait to, to, to share being in the kingdom with you. Jesus is looking forward to the day when he could be with us physically. Physically. He's with us in spirit. But Jesus is looking at that day when we're really going to rally up. And right now I know you're connected and we're connected in this way in spirit. But man, we're going to be together again. But no matter what, Jesus is fully present with you and with me. And we are never alone because Jesus knows all about where we are. He's been there. He's our sympathizing priest. Jesus sympathizes with everything you and I are going through. So this morning we see into his humanity and we're encouraged that he, he understands us. We also see into his divinity this morning by the response that he makes. He leads us to the Father. We take up our cross. Jesus is with us today in the garden of whatever it is we're going through. Whatever it is we're anticipating. Whatever it is we're coming through. We must cling to Christ today. Not the news, but to Christ. Not to social media, but to Christ. Not to Facebook, but to Christ. Not to human leadership, but to Christ. Foremost. Not to fears, but to Christ. Because with Christ, we're never alone. He is with us. Be the church, my friends. Be Jesus. He's with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning that has great relevance in our life today. Speak to the hearts of your people who have tuned in, who are part of Ocean State or part of another church where they are, that you may help them to meditate on the truths that are here in this text and the truths that you're speaking to us. Oh, Lord, it doesn't matter if it all goes down, Father. We know your church will not be prevailed against by the gates of hell. Your church will continue. Father, we pray for the times in which we live and ask you to give us the wisdom we need, the hope we need, and to be the church is to be Christ. Father, we praise you and thank you today for this day of worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May God bless you.